song gets me every time. Every time. And sometimes in my life when I just was hanging on to that hope by the skin of my teeth, but I hung on. And that's why he's there, boys and girls. He is, Jesus is our hope. No matter what happens to us in life, he's our hope, isn't he? Yes, he is. Okay, let's get through this, Miss Kennedy. Thank you, Gina. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you, Jaja. Ja. Uh, I'm going to read you one of my favorite stories out of the Bible this morning. And I love this story because it's a man named Peter. It's about a man named Peter. And, and I'm a lot like Peter. So I want you to listen closely to the story, okay? Night was coming, and Jesus was tired. It had been such a busy day for him. He wanted to be by himself for a while. He wanted to be alone, and he wanted to pray. So he went up into the hills, and when he did, his friends got into their boat, and they started rowing to the other side of the lake. All of a sudden, a storm blew up. We have seen storms blow up real fast, haven't we? In, our, in, in Texas, where we live, storms can come up just like that. And one time, Kobe yeah, and my yeah. dad, like, down into I, a tornado. I know. It's <laughs> This is my Sunday school class right here, in a nutshell. Okay, here we go. So a storm came up all of a sudden, and, and the, the, the wind started blowing the boat, and the lightning was popping, and the thunder was thundering, and it was loud, and it was scary, and it, the wind began to push the boat back, and push the boat back, and the waves got higher and higher, and the boat was just going up and down, up and down, and they were having a really hard time rowing. And Jesus looked. And he saw that they were having trouble out on that stormy lake. And he came to them walking on the water. Can we walk on the water? No. No. Okay. When they saw him, they were scared. They said, do y'all see that? Do y'all see that man walking on the water? I think it's a ghost. I think it's a ghost. They didn't even know it was Jesus. They thought it was a ghost. And Jesus knew that they were scared, and he hollered out. He said, hey, don't be afraid. It's me. Peter thought, is that really Jesus? Is it Jesus? Is it really you? If it's really you, he said, Jesus, tell me to come to you on the water too. And Jesus looked at him and said, well, Peter, come on. Come on. Step out of that boat. So Peter got out of the boat, and he took one step, and he took two steps, and he took three steps. And he was walking on the water, too. Don't you imagine his eyeballs were like this? Yeah, like that, Hayes. That's exactly right. <laughs> and all of a sudden, while he was walking on the water, he began to look around. And he saw the waves coming up over his head, and they were throwing him around. He could feel the wind blowing. And he looked up, and he saw the lightning flashing, and the thunder was popping. And he took his eyes off of Jesus for that fast. That quick, he began to look around, and he began to sink because he had taken his eyes off of Jesus. And he got scared, and he started hollering out, Jesus, Jesus, save me, save me. And right away, Jesus reached down, and he pulled Peter up, and he said, Peter, why were you scared? Why were you so scared? I was right there with you, and you were scared. They climbed into the boat, and Jesus calmed the storm, and everyone worshiped Jesus. You truly are God's son, they said. Boys and girls, I'm a lot like Peter. I walk around in this world, and I think I've got the world by the tail, and I'm thinking, you know, I can, I can do this by myself. I can do this thing called life all by myself. I don't need God. I don't need him. So I stopped praying. I stopped reading my Bible, and I stopped going to church. I can do it myself. I can do it all by myself. And then, bam, my mom gets so sick, I have to put her in the hospital. So sick. And I cry out, God, my mom is so sick. And I'm scared. And then Chelsea calls and said, Mom, Palmer's been sick for two days. She's been throwing up and running fever, and I've taken her to the doctor twice, and she's not getting any better. I don't know what to do. What do I do? And then, bam, 
my son calls me and he says, Mom, guess what? And I'm thinking by that time, what? He said, I've been offered a job in New York. I'm moving to New York. And I cry out and I said, Lord, please, New York, New York is so far away. So far away and my heart is so hurt because it'll be so far away from me. Now boys and girls, maybe those kind of things have not happened to you, but maybe these have. Oh Lord, mom and dad are at it again. They're always fighting about something. Oh Lord. We're gonna tell secrets on you. Oh Lord, I tried so hard, but I still cannot pass that star test. I don't know what to do, Lord. Oh, Lord, I left the gate open and all the horses got out and my dad is so mad at me. He's so mad, I can't do anything right. My heart feels sick. Now, boys and girls, what do you think? You know, God's sitting up on his throne in heaven and we're just telling him all our problems, all our problems, all our problems. But yet, we've quit reading our Bible We've quit coming to church. We've quit praying because I can do this on my own. What do you think God, how do you think he feels? Do you think God, when he keeps hearing all these problems that we're throwing at him, do you think he goes, mm, no, not today. Not today. You see what happens when we do that? We're just like Peter. We take our eyes off of God. And we put them on ourselves. And we put them on our problems and we put them on the world, don't we? So what do you think he does when he hears this? Does he say, not today, not today? No, no, he doesn't. He does just like he did with Peter. He reaches down in the middle of our storm and he pulls us up. And he helps us with our problems. He comforts us and he gives us his peace that only he can give, and he assures us that he is always with us. He's always with us. Now let me ask you this. What are some problems that we have today that we might go to the Lord with? Money problems? Mom and Dad, do you ever hear Mom and Dad talk about money problems? Do you ever hear about uh, somebody that's sick in your family? That's a storm. Do you ever hear about bullying? You see bullying going on at school? That's a storm. You try and try and try and try, but you're still making bad grades, that's a storm. Fighting with brothers and sisters, that's a storm. We have storms in our life all the time, boys and girls, but let me tell you what. We have to keep our eyes on Jesus. We have to keep our heart on Jesus. We have to keep our whole selves on Jesus so that when all these storms come and all these problems are happening and you're panicking and you're getting scared and you're going, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do, get your mind on it, get your heart on it and think about him and stay focused. Now boys and girls, we have to stay constantly focused on God. How do we become closer to God? We come to church to learn more about him. We talk to him, what is that called? Praying, that's right. That's right, and we read our Bible, and that gets us closer to him. Now listen to me, boys and girls. I'm an old woman, and I'm pretty old. And I'm going to tell you one thing. If you, don't, if you don't remember anything else, you remember this, okay? Everybody look at me. Jesus loves you. He will never leave you. He will never turn his back on you. He will never ignore you. He is always there for you. 24-7, he's right there with you. And he wants you to talk to him. He wants you to grow closer to him. He wants you to accept him as your savior, boys and girls. We need him. Life is too hard without him. Life is too hard without him. We gotta have some help down here. And he is our help. And he is our hope. So you remember that today. And I am so thankful that we have a God that loves us that much. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Father God, we just thank you for this day, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that you are our hope. When everything else is falling apart around us, Lord, you're our hope. Help us to always keep our heart and our mind and our soul focused on you. 
Help us to know, Lord, that you are with us no matter what, no matter what we've done, no matter what we've said. You are still there with us, Lord, and you want us to cry out to you for help. We love you so, so much. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Okay, do we have any birthdays or anniversaries this morning? Okay, let's turn to page 93, page 93.
<laughs> Too many mics. It's it's on. It's just not real loud. Well, anyway, as we go through the study, we're in chapter 2, verses 12 through 26 of Ecclesiastes. I've titled this section, The Equalizer. Now, the reason why that is, is because this whole book points to a lot of things about life. One of the main things it tells us is that in the end, we all face the same thing. No matter where you're at in life, no matter what you do, no matter any of that you're going to face the same fate. Nobody gets out of this life alive, as we've heard. Nobody goes any further than where they're at. You either go to heaven or hell when you die, but each and every one of us will die. That is the great equalizer. And that's what we see in this section. He gets to this point and he talks about it and says all of these things that are building up to it. And I took this title from a movie. I'm sure many in here have seen the movie. Denzel Washington made several years ago. He's a ex highly trained something, covert operator anyway, but he's retired and he's been working at a hardware store doing all these things, but he goes to a late night cafe every night and takes a book and takes his own tea and sits there. He's very detailed, very meticulous, very everything. And he befriends this girl who is in forced prostitution through the Russian mafia. Well, in this friendship, they talk and discuss things, and she talks to him about the books he's reading, and so forth, so on. Well, then he hears and finds out that she's been roughed up pretty severely by this mafia. So he goes to him, draws all sorts of money, goes to him to buy her, to get her out of this ring. They just mock and laugh at him and all of this. Well, he walks to the door, locks it, and turns around, scans the room, and says, 20 seconds. And he goes through and he tears that room apart and takes out every single man in that room. And it's right at his 22nd mark. He's a little rusty. He's at like 21. And then throughout the rest of the movie, we see he does the same thing. He goes through. Anybody who crosses his path that has done evil or wicked meets the same fate. It's where their life ends. And that's what Solomon is telling us right here. He is telling us, that it does not matter where you are, who you are, what you have, what you don't have, or any of that, you meet the same fate. So it doesn't matter whether we're ugly, whether we're pretty, whether we're thin, whether we're overweight, whether we're wealthy, whether we're poor, whether we're American, whether we're Hindu, whether we're whatever, we all will die. That's what he says right here. Every one of us will die. But he's going on and we see in a second that he returns. Last week we looked at where he reviewed pleasure. Where he reviewed enjoyment and drinking and partying and all of these things and going, it's all vanity. What's the point? There's no, it doesn't matter how much we drink. It doesn't matter how much we party. It doesn't matter how much fun we have. In the end, it's all vanity and pointless because it still leaves us empty. And in chapter 1, we'd seen where he'd already kind of looked at wisdom and folly. Well, he returns to that. It's no different than when we're looking for something, right? You've misplaced your keys. You go look where they should be. They're not there. So you scrounge around and look. What do you do? You go back to where they should be and look again, thinking, hey, maybe they'll be back. Not much unlike a time I was taking care of some cattle for a guy and all that, and I had bulls. I'd gathered them, had them in a pasture, and a bull had got out. Well, me and my cousin Stephen were there. We'd been doing some work. We stopped in there to check the bulls, feed them, and all that, and go on to another place. And we count, we're one short. Well, we sit there and count them and drive and look and can't find them, can't find them. We trot around, can't find them. And Stephen says, as much as I try by counting them again and again, I just can't make that bull be there. And that's what we see here. Solomon is going back to examine wisdom and folly once again after he's already looked at it because he's gone through pleasure. He has checked that pleasure doesn't give you fulfillment. Pleasure doesn't give you what you need. Pleasure is good in all, as we'll see at the very end of this chapter, but it's only good when we see what the end of this chapter says. That's why it's good. So the fact of the matter is, we continue to go back in search for the purpose of life in the same old, tired, worn-out places. As the book of Proverbs says, it's like a pig going back to its own vomit. Anytime we step out of the path with the Lord Jesus Christ and look to the world, 
for our fulfillment, we miss it because we're going back to the old, dead, tired places. Just as Kathy talked about Peter walking on the water, he took his eyes off Christ and he sunk. That's all that it'll give us. The same old, tired places. Now granted, as we'll see in a second, wisdom is better than folly. Wisdom is better than ignorance. Even though he says, with wisdom comes all of this vexation and struggle. But wisdom is still better. Because in wisdom, we learn about Christ, as I have said before. In wisdom, we learn about things we shouldn't do because it brings nothing but pain and suffering. In wisdom, we learn the knowledge of God, which is the most important thing. So we can't let that hold us back. Because... Wisdom is crucial. So, as the text says, Ecclesiastes 2, 12 through 26, and we read, So I turn to consider wisdom and madness and folly, for what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. Then I saw that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly, as there is more gain in light than in darkness. The wise person has eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I perceive that the same event happens to all of them. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For of the wise as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance. Seeing that in the days to come, all will have been long forgotten. How the wise dies just like the fool. So I hated life because what is done under the sun was grievous to me. For all is vanity and a striving after wind. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. There is nothing better for a person... Now listen to these last three verses. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from Him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases Him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, He has given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. So, the equalizer comes. The equalizer is here. The equalizer points to what the fate of all is. So in the end, we're all the same. We're all the same in the end. That's what he has discovered in this search so far up to this point. In the end, we're all the same. Whether you're wise, whether you're a fool, whether you're whatever you are, we're all the same. But he says, wisdom is better than folly. Wisdom is better than being a fool. Why is that? He says, because the wise have eyes in their head to see. The wise can perceive what is going on in life. The wise look around them and understand what is going on. But the problem is, as we see with wisdom too, some arrogance and some other things. People get to the point where they think wisdom is the key. Wisdom is the purpose. Wisdom is the end all be all. Wisdom is what people strive after. We see it in today's society in so many ways where I remember growing up in school, the teachers constantly, constantly pushing, you must go to college, you must go to college, you have to go to college. If you don't go to college, you'll never make a living. You'll be poor, you'll be broke, you'll be this, you'll be that. You'll be the garbage truck driver. Well, guess what? The garbage truck driver makes more money than a teacher. You don't have to have an education. The electrician, the plumber, the welder, all these people, and we need them. But people have been so hung up on wisdom, this all stems out of the Enlightenment period that is saying wisdom is key, wisdom is crucial. If you don't have all of this knowledge, 
then you're no good. And I hate to break it to them. I know people who are smarter than some of the smartest people I've ever met, and they don't have, they barely even have a high school education, if even a high school education. Wisdom is totally different than knowledge, but with wisdom you get knowledge. Wisdom is important because we can see things. One reason why that is, as, as we see in this text, as it goes on, and he talks about it, we can see in the dark. We're not walking in darkness. See, the fool, also as you read in Psalm 14, says the fool says in his heart, there is no God. That is walking in darkness. If we're walking in darkness, we don't believe in God. If we're walking as a fool, we don't believe in God. Now there's many people who say, yeah, yeah, there's a God, but they're still a fool because they're a willful atheist. They're saying, yeah, I know there's a God, but I don't want to believe in God, so I'm going to ignore that fact, and I'm going to say, yeah, I've heard all this same old tired trope, all this stuff over and over and over again, but who cares? I'm just going to walk in darkness because I don't want there to be a God. Now there's some atheists out there who just reject and on terms. They have arguments. They have their proofs, so forth, so on. But ultimately, they're just walking in darkness. That's what a fool does. And what happens when you walk in darkness and don't know at all where you're going? Well, I can tell you right now, even walking through my own home that I know the layout of, and I'm walking in the dark, my depth perception is off, and I hang a toe. And everybody in the house knows. That's what happens when you walk in the dark. You can't perceive what is before you. You can't perceive what is around you. So what happens is the fool continues going on in life and then death hits and they're gone and they have no clue that it was coming. They live their lives as if their life is going to go on forever. See, the wise perceives death coming. The wise knows it's happening. The wise know that there's something more so they plan their life accordingly. Some people do this in the fact that they just create a will. That's wiser than people that don't do it. But if you don't have God in your life, if you have not placed your faith in Jesus Christ, if you are not sealed by the Holy Spirit, having a will does nothing but give your family whatever you're going to leave behind, as we'll see in a minute. Yeah, you stop the government from getting it. At least some of it. But you still have the same fate as the fool. Now the wise, they perceive death is coming. The wise know it's happening, but they have God. They have Christ. They have placed their faith in Him. And they see death, and they're like the Apostle Paul. To live is Christ, but to die is gain because I'm going to be with Him. I can't change that faith that's coming to me. I can't change that I'm going to die. Yeah, I don't know what day it's going to be. I don't know when it's going to come. I don't know if it's going to be tomorrow. I don't know if it's going to be 20 years, 30, 40, 50. I don't know. None of us do. But the one thing we can know, and this is where true wisdom lies, is in the knowledge of God. And when your faith is in Jesus Christ, whenever that time comes, whenever that fate hits you, whenever you die and you leave this earth, your soul goes to your everlasting home, you have shown wisdom because you've placed your faith in Christ, and that is where you are. That is what he is saying here. That is where the, it is better. That is why it is better. But still, the same fate happens to us all. As 13 and 14 tells us, he says, you know, the more gain in wisdom, less in folly, the wise person sees, but the same event happens to all of them. So one thing we can take from this, here's one key point we can take. Yes, we're all the same. That's why I did this section, this point, we're all the same. Nobody's better than anybody else. Nobody is above anybody else. We're all equal. We're all created in the image of God. We all are under the curse. We all are in the fallen world. We all will die. So no matter where you're at in life, no matter what status you have, no matter if you're wealthy, you're poor, wherever you are, you are no better than anybody else. That great equalizer lets us know that we're all the same. There's been men for centuries seeking the fountain of youth. Been men for centuries doing all these things, trying to get everlasting life right here. They miss where true everlasting life is. Seeking it right here. That's where wisdom sometimes will lead you astray. You get too smart for your own good. 
It's many times I've had some horses in my life. I was blessed to have some pretty nice horses. I don't know who was training them in the middle of the night for me, but they were doing a great job. And these horses, I'd get in the gate or be working a herd or something, and they'd get to work and, and they would think they knew exactly the cows that I didn't want to let in. But sometimes when you're working a gate, especially if it's shipper day or whatever, you'll let a dry cow or a whatever cow go through into the shipper pen. Well, they'd be trying to stop the cow when I'd be trying to get them to get out of the way of the cow. They were too smart for their own good. And that's what happens with us sometimes when we start trusting wisdom too much. We become too smart for our own good. We become too wise for our own good. And then we go through this and we see, so why be wise? Why do anything? Why? I don't get it. What is the point? Why? Why even keep living? Why even keep going? Yeah, it might be better to be wise, but why? What's the purpose? Why do we keep doing it? Especially if in the end, our gains don't matter. So that's why we see Solomon saying in verses 17 through 18, 20, 22, and 23, that he hates life. He hates his toil. He gave his heart up to despair. That all we do is nothing but sorrow, vexation, and that we can't rest at night because our hearts are so consumed with it. Well, the purpose of this is, he's not saying that he, you know, that it's a hate, hate, hate life, like he's, you know, hates everything about it. What he's talking about is it's, it's, it's that, where you just, like you hate winter. Yeah, you may hate it, but you don't hate it so much that you don't want to be in it, and like you'd want to continue going on. So there's this different type of hate here. It's a dislike of it. He's disgusted with it. That's a good word. He's disgusted with it and he gives up to despair and all of these things because that is all it will lead you to. If you're pursuing everything in this life, you're not going to rest at night. The Lord gives sleep to those who are His. That is a gift of God to us is sleep. And if you're laying awake at night, worried and concerned over your property, over your job, over whatever it may be, your family, if you're so afraid of all of this material stuff that you have that you cannot sleep at night, life is despair. All that happens when you do that is you become bitter. You become hateful. You start hating. You start reclusing. You start hiding everything from people. You don't get involved. You don't love. You don't have compassion. You don't serve. You don't go because you're so ate up with what you're doing. You've got to work. You'll throw out the old trope. Well, I, you know, It's work. The more I work, the more I get from my family. The better the house, the better the vehicles, the better the clothes, the better the food, the more vacations we can have. Yeah, but while you're doing all that and you're striving and working and working, when you go on vacation, what are you doing? Thinking about work. Think about all the money you're spending right there that you could be making to do other things with. Your mind gets so wrapped up with money and stuff that you miss life. You lay awake at night. I get it. I used to be there. I used to have some of them struggles. I used to worry and concern and be like, I don't know what's going to happen. And finally I said, I don't care. It took some hard prayer and God working in my life, but I finally realized, you know what? So be it. If I have to go without some things, let it be, Lord. I trust You. But we get so hung up in it. We get to where we can't rest. We get to where we can't do anything. So we give up our heart to despair. Guess what? It doesn't matter what you build, what you lay up, what you do, you're going to leave it behind. You can't take it. So we need to live our life more like this little story of the architect, Frank Lloyd Wright. Very famous architect from back in the day. He tells this incident that seemed very insignificant in his life. But it had a profound influence on him. He was about nine and he went walking across the snow-covered field with his reserved, no-nonsense uncle. As the two of them reached the far end of the field, his uncle stopped him he pointed to his own tracks in the snow, straight and true as an arrow's flight, and then young Frank's tracks meandering all over the field. He said, Notice how your tracks wander aimlessly from fence to the cattle to the woods and back again. His uncle said, And see how my tracks aim directly to my goal. There is an important lesson in that. Years later, the architect liked to tell how this experience had greatly contributed to his philosophy in life. 
He said, I determined right then, with a little twinkle in his eye, not to miss most things in life as my uncle had. See, when we get so devoted to this one goal, this one purpose, and to reach this one thing, and to have this right here, the American dream, you know? Let's just have this. Let's focus on it. Man, I look at all these other people's things. I'm like, oh, good. I, you, look at that. I need to work harder to get that. I need this. I need this. We miss life. Yes, we were created to work. Yes, we should work. Yes, we must work. Yes, we have to work. That is a mandate from God. That is a command from God to work. We work. But we don't let work be the end all be all of everything in our life. Because everything will be left behind. And when we focus on our work and we start focusing on that, that becomes our God. And we kick God to the curb. Say, I don't need you in my life. I have this. And that throne that we put that on will collapse. So we need to focus on Him. Because I was reading in a commentary this week, and this is what this one man said. He's got several quotes here from things that happen when we die. These are quotes that men have said over the years. Rabbis used to say, a child comes into the world with clenched fists, ready to grab for everything, but a corpse leaves with open palms, unable to take anything with them. Death is the great equalizer. Everything comes to nothing. Another Jewish proverb says, there are no pockets in a shroud. You can't take anything with you. George Strait saying, I ain't ever seen a hearse with a luggage rack. And Billy Graham used to say, you can't take the U-Haul to the cemetery. After all of life's labors, nothing goes with the human when he dies. We leave it all behind. So what good is gain? What good is the works that we do under the sun? What good is all of the stuff that we do? What is the purpose? Why? Why? As I said, the last three verses are very important. In the end, enjoyment is only in the Lord. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from Him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? It is Him. It is all Him. It is from Him. This verse 26a says, For to the one who pleases Him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. See, it's in Him only. We cannot have true joy and contentment without God. No matter what anybody says, I don't care what they say, they're lying through their teeth. If they say, I love life, I am enjoying everything of life, but I do not believe in God. There is no God. They don't have true joy and contentment. They're full of bitterness and hatred, even if they don't know it. They don't care. No one can have true pleasure in the things that we have apart from God. Because when you are focused on God and you look to Him and you see Him and it's all Him, you see that everything you have is a gift from Him. He is the Creator who blessed you and gave it. And if you lose it, you can be His job and say, blessed is the Lord who gives and the Lord who takes away. Because He gave it to me, but now I don't need it, so He took it from my life and I can keep walking straight because I know He is just, true, perfect, and pure, and righteous, and holy. And in Him, I have joy, regardless of my circumstances. That's what we can say, because it's only Him. But see, on down after this point, after 26a, the last part of that says, but to the sinner He has given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give to the one who pleases God. The sinner doesn't get anything. They give it all away. Jesus expounds on this when He says in the Gospels, you know, the first will be last and the last will be first. And when he talks about the men who had the minas, remember the parable of the minas and how the two went and invested and grew and got and did and the one buried it in the ground because he was a fool? He says, take from that one and give to the one who has the much because those who have little will be given to those who have much because they didn't do anything. That's what this is talking about. Those who fail to serve or believe in God will lose everything. They have nothing. All they have are the gains they get here. That's it. It's a pointless existence without the Lord. So one thing we can say, like, but the world is so tough. There's so much hardship. It's brutal. How can there be joy in all of this depression 
and all this anxiety that Solomon has just talked about, all of this stuff that's going to go on, how can it be the best of times and the worst of times? As Charles Dickens wrote. There was a guy that was pleading with him, this old cartoon, that was telling him, Mr. Dickens, either it was the best of times or it was the worst of times, it can't be both. Many of us think the same way, don't we? How can it be both? How can this paradox happen? How can we have the best of times and the worst of times? How can these two things be at the same time? It can be. It's worse because we live in a world cursed by sin. But it's also a world that God created very good. And that He has visited in the flesh and is working to redeem through the life, death, and resurrection of His Son. That is how we can experience joy as well as sorrow. But it's only if we know God in a personal and saving way. That's the only way. And that's what Solomon is saying. We can have joy in the things we have because we know who gave them. So enjoy what you have. This is why the old saying of people who are rich Christians, if they have the money and they go buy a Lamborghini, and people are, I can't believe they went and bought that Lamborghini. They should have gave that money to the orphans or this or that. Well, the fact of the matter is, we don't know what they give. And the thing is, they may be financially able to afford that thing. And guess what? God has blessed them with that so they can luxuriously have it. We can't call somebody out on their wealth. God has blessed them. That's between them and God. If their conscience is clear and they're doing it in faith, it's not sin. Because Paul says anything done without faith is sin. If you do it in good faith to the Lord that what you're doing is not sin, you're fine. You can go on a vacation. You can do this. But don't let that consume you and eat up all your money. You need to use your money to glorify God and bring in people to worship and ministry. Because God has chose us to be the ones to do that. And He has blessed us. So we can enjoy it. We can serve Him. We can give away. We can do things. One of the things I like to do is you see up there with the free book table, I love to buy a bunch of Bibles and then rig them up with new ribbons and things and put them out and give them away to people. I like doing that. Something I like doing. Everybody needs a good Bible. I like giving you good Bibles. If you don't have one, come to me. I'll give you one. I don't care. I'll give you this one if you don't have one and you need one. That's just things we need to do because it is joy and pleasure because God has blessed us with so many things. We don't need to be hung up on the things. We need to enjoy helping others with what we've been blessed with. That is a great way to have pleasure and enjoyment with what you have. But we can't do it unless we focus on Him. We can't do it unless we know that everything we have is a gift from Him. We can do it because we know... Our joy comes from Him who gives abundantly above anything we can ever imagine. That's why our joy is there. He will give abundantly above and beyond all you can imagine. It may not be here. That's the thing. We're not living for the here. We can't be living for the here. Because as I've said before in this series, anything transient can never give you satisfaction. It will go away and it will be lost. And if you place all your hope and faith in that, then it's gone, you're broken. It must be in the supernatural, not the natural. Because He will give so much more. So much more. Will my people for the communion start getting it ready? All the guys I ask. (laughs) As I come to the conclusion. So in wrapping this up, we'll go into our communion in a second. Solomon has told us that the wise and the fool alike are the same, that our gains and purposes don't matter in the end. Don't go ahead and start passing it out. But we can enjoy things in the Lord alone. That's what he's told us. It doesn't matter. We're all the same. All our gains are left for naught. They're just left behind. They're not going to be here. It's better to be a wise than a fool. But you can find perfect enjoyment in the Lord. And it doesn't matter. This information is impactful because it's true. You've lived it in experience. You've lived it. You know it. It is true. It has happened. Every one of us at some point in our life has looked to something in the creation to give us value and worth. And then when we lose it, you're upset. 
You may be saying you've never done it, but you have when you were a child with a toy. Or a blanket, or a stuffed animal, or a whatever. Just think about that. When you see your kids, and they have a specific toy or animal, stuffed animal that they love, and then it goes missing, what happens? It's like Chernobyl all over again. That's what happens when all of our hope and all of our faith is placed in that. I want to end with some of these solid insights right here. Men have pursued joy in every avenue imaginable. Some have successfully found it, while others have not. It's easier to describe where joy cannot be found. Not in unbelief. Voltaire, from the Enlightenment period and all that, he was a major schismatic against God, all of that. And he, you know, wrote, I wish I had never been born because this world didn't fulfill him. And it's not in pleasure. Lord Byron, who was a romantic poet of that time frame, who had all kinds of things, he was large in that romantic movement. So, you know, the romantic times and all of that, where they wrote all these poems and all of this stuff, and it was all about love and all of this, very much like the 60s, only back in the you know, a long time ago, the 1700s. He says, the worm, the canker, and grief are mine alone. Nothing from pleasure. Not in money. Jay Gould, an American millionaire, had plenty of money, but when he was dying, he said, I suppose I'm the most miserable man on earth. Not in position or fame. There was a guy named Lord Beaconsfield over in Europe who was a two-time prime minister and an earl, and all of these things. So his position and fame was big. But he wrote, youth is a mistake, manhood a struggle, old age a regret. There was nothing good. He had all of that stuff and none of it was good. And it's not in military glory. Alexander the Great, we all know who Alexander the Great was. He had conquered the known world of his day. He never lost a battle. He went into everything and won every single victory he ever fought, every battle. Nothing was ever lost to him. He won every one of them. He was a genius in the battlefield. And at the end of his life, he was weeping in his tent saying there are no more worlds to conquer. So where then is real joy found? Where is it found? Thank you. It's simple. It is found in Christ alone. It is in Christ alone. That is the only place you're going to find joy. That is the only place you're going to find pleasure. That is the only place you're going to find true wisdom. Is in Christ alone. And I hope today you will find your true joy in the Lord Jesus Christ and the eternal salvation He offers because of His death, burial, and resurrection. It is made possible to each and every one of us who believe before that great equalizer finds you. Because it will find you. This that we're fixing to celebrate the breaking of bread of His body, the juice of the cup, His blood. He shed this, broke this, gave it for each and every one of us. That's why we can have joy. That is why we can have wisdom. That is why we don't have to seek pleasure and joy and worth and value and all of these things. Is because we have the true value. We have the secret to life. It's in Jesus Christ. It's Him. Nothing else. Nothing else. No matter, no matter, there is nothing else that will give you the joy that He can. We're still going to suffer in this world. It's going to happen. We're going to have struggles. We're going to have heartache. We're going to be abused. We're going to be bruised. We're going to be beaten. We're going to be mocked. We're going to be scorned. We're going to be lied to. We're going to be cheated on. We're going to be dealt terrible hands. Jesus Christ was beat with a rod. He was whipped with the lashes of the Romans who knew how to handle it. He had the crown of thorns jammed on His head. He was spit on. He was mocked. He was scorned. He was made to carry the instrument of his own death to the hill. He was laid on that rough hewn log with splinters poking everywhere. The crossbeam, arms stretched out, 
spikes drove through his wrists, hands, and his feet, and stood up to suffer for us all. A spear was run through his side, and he was drugged down and wrapped up, not even able to be fully prepared for burial, and put in a borrowed tomb. Jesus Christ, the God the Son, did that for us. Worthy of so much more. But that's what He did. This body of His was broken for us. And He said on that night, take and eat as often as you do in remembrance of Me. Take the bread. And He said, this cup is My blood. As often as you drink, remember Me. Never forget where your joy is found. Never forget that this world will not offer it. It's only in Christ. It's only in Christ. And as I said, I pray that today you find where your true joy is in Him before that equalizer comes hunting for you. Trent, will you close us in prayer?